know about our Purple Heart project and you want to take it a step further, next time you place an order, get one of our Purple Heart pins. They're only $5 and we give all that $5 to the Purple Heart project. Thanks to Colonel Luthi for finding and sourcing these. This is a great way to tell the world about a problem that exists that's huge and we need to do something about it. Bring combat wounded veterans in so we can treat them to a week of hand tool woodwork and train them and help them deal with their pain. There it is. We are live. Yeah, like as in filming? Yep. As in howdy? Good evening, everyone. Hi, folks. Welcome to whatever number this is. It's a lot. And uh, lots of stuff today. Lots of good stuff. And probably the best thing of all is the prize that we have that we're going to draw. By the way, I got my voice back. Um, should I introduce that now or should I, I probably should do it a couple of times? I'll give you the short version. Back in 2015, I got an email completely out of the blue. And this uh, guy said, Rob, I really like what you're doing. And uh, I sent you some money. And if you want, if you want to just start drawing and giving drawing names and giving tools away, I'd happy, I would be happy to finance it. Well, the check came. Of course, I didn't know who the individual was, and it cleared the banks. So I thought, oh, this is interesting. So to sum that up real quickly, over that year, oh, he sent me thousands of dollars that we distributed by drawing and giving folks tools. In our online workshop, we used to have a draw every Monday night. We did one draw for the uh, hand tool workshop, one for the power tool workshop. And we'd give away $200, $300 worth of tools to each one. Then he ended up paying for... Just, just, just a second. Uh, flip his mic around. I'm getting connection issues. Like that. How is it? All right. Can you hear me? Yeah. Can you hear me now? It's cutting out for some reason. What's that doing? I have no idea. Not my department. Can I keep talking while you guys work on that? Yeah, go ahead. It seems to be a little... Anyway, bit. so we nicknamed him Santa Claus, which I believe he's on tonight, Santa, and his wife, Mrs. Claus. He, uh, he ended up paying for one summer five people to come to our, uh, our workshop and covered all their expenses. And then when I got that phone call, that email from Jesse, who inspired the Purple Heart Project, I, uh, I read it, and here was this uh, beat-up combat wounded marine who uh, was enjoying the peace that he got from woodworking from both physical and mental pain and he couldn't afford a regular he couldn't afford a new saw I want to know if I had any that were had cosmetic flaws that would sell cheaper and I just remember thinking I got to call Santa over this so I emailed Santa Claus and I said you know we've helped a lot of people but I think we found someone that really deserves our help and within an hour he emailed me back and said you uh, get a hold of uh, Jesse and and tell him he's coming to Canada for a week, spend a week with you at a workshop. And he says, I'll take care of all of it. Well, it, we tried to do that. It didn't work out, but it started the whole process. And by the way, I got an email from Jesse. Are we, are we able to pull a picture up off my text onto the... Uh, yeah. Because th this, this is such a great success story. But you know what? I'm actually going to save that for when we bring on Mark to introduce the PHP. Because you got to see, you got to see this. Anyway, Santa Claus has uh, was, was hadn't heard from him in a long time. He was sick. He's gotten better, and he just contacted me recently. And he is providing tonight's giveaway. So here's what we're doing. First of all, I'll show you this. If you uh, watch our YouTube's, we recently cut up a Vera Wood log, sacred to Super Dave. Is it up there, Jake? Yeah. Can you see it? So we cut this log up. That was a $500 Vera Wood log. It was 39. 39 inches? No. 27 inches long, about that big in diameter. 
had no idea what to expect, couldn't tell from the outside, but we were pleasantly surprised. So here's, here's the inside of the Vera wood, and here's what it oxidizes to, beautiful emerald green. There's the inside, and you can see where it's already started to oxidize. This was more typical. And there's what it oxidizes to. So that's been sitting out. And that actually, the funny thing is, there's no UV light in this shop because there are no windows. But it still oxidizes like that. Gorgeous wood. Now you know why Super Dave's in love with it. Anyway, so, and because the color hasn't quite changed yet, that's what I'm telling you. So tonight's prize is a Vera Wood dovetail saw along with a Vera Wood marking gauge. So somebody is going to uh, get lucky and win that tonight. The two of them together, $1,200? $1,200. Thank you to Santa Claus. So, Frick, is the uh, link up there? I will put it up, yeah. You don't have to uh, spend any money. You just have to put your name in and say, I'd like to be considered for the draw. We'll do that at the end tonight. I'll actually put this somewhere where we can see it all night. Now, why do we do this? Well, we do this to raise money for our Purple Heart Project, where we bring in combat wounded veterans and treat them to a, a week, a six day, very intense hand tool workshop. And we cover all their expenses, airfare, hotel, meals. Each vet goes home with in excess of $3,400, $3,500 worth of hand tools, premium stuff by the way, same stuff I use, as well as we now have our bench brigade thanks to Jack Lane. I was on the phone with Jack today and, uh, and uh, we were talking to, um, who was on the phone with? Oh, Sean. Sean McDermott. And Sean is the next vet to get a, uh, Sean was in class, 2000 and sp spring class of 2017 and um, great guy Sean and his wife Angela so Sean is going to get the next bench and it's being delivered by I've, I've got to look up his name because this guy is a high school shop teacher and he's taken upon himself to build benches for the, for the Purple Heart Project uh, with his students and uh, I, I, I'll check my phone shortly and give you the exact on it. Anyway, the purple, the way the bench brigade works is civilians or military personnel volunteer to build the bench to our specs. We provide them with the vice and then they deliver it to a combat wounded vet that has been to our class that lives closest to them. And we've got one, I'll tell you about that a little bit later, that's going all the way over to Hawaii and the builder flies for UPS and they've arranged to have him fly with that plane to go over there and personally deliver it to uh, Zach, who was in our class two years ago, a year and a half ago, a year ago. He was, in our, was he in our first spring class in our new shop, I think. Anyway, it's coming to him. It's going to be fantastic. All of these, by the way, are videotaped. We always get the spouse or somebody to videotape them, and we put them up on our Facebook page, which is, Frick, how do they find the Facebook page? for the Bench Brigade? Uh, it is under. Tell me when you find it. So we just had one delivered. Who, who just got theirs? Chris. Chris, and pronounce Chris's last name for me. Laverkin. Laverkin. Now Chris was a, 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 fuel a fuel truck driver in Iraq, and I think it was a roadside bomb. He ended up losing, uh, losing his leg below the knee on one side as a result of that injury. But great guy, he came here and he came as a result of Ivan, right? And Ivan, who's from Texas, came to our class and we always asked the vets, we said, look, you know best who deserves this, find us someone. And that's how we ended up with Chris. So those videos are on there, you can watch them and participate in this and it's fantastic. So I just posted the link. Good, thank you. All right, so that's the prize. The link's in there for you to, uh, to uh, apply to get in the, in the draw. and. Anyone that would like to donate, as I told Jack today, I said, you know, we could figure out a way to pay for this ourselves. We had been up until the last couple of years. But 
the feeling that you get when you participate in this, knowing what it's doing, is beyond measure. Money doesn't matter. If you'd like to participate in some way, whether it's finding us another vet or financing part of it, then you can, he'll put the link on there tonight, and, uh, and we will gladly accept your donation, and we promise you that we will use it just for bringing in these guys and covering those expenses. Okay, now, quick look of what we're able to, oh yeah, I want to show you something. This is a, so we're in the process of insulating the shop, long work, anyway. So Kirk is a friend of mine, he's the guy doing the insulator. And he came to me today, he says, Robbie says, I found something I thought you'd like. So Kirk's business is going in and insulating attics and basements and whatever. So he often finds stuff. And he found this in somebody's attic and they let him have it. And he thought I would enjoy it. And um, it belonged to Wesley Gordon Vale. I think that's what that is. The last uh, date on this was 19, 19, 1951, 10 years before I was born. But it's in really good, remarkably good shape, but it goes through and it gives you all kinds of general woodworking knowledge. And I like going in and reading this and seeing where some of these ideas came from. And I will tell you, I don't think they're all 100% sound, but interesting to know how they get started. Covers everything from sharpening saws to uh, running power tools to building stairs, dovetails. And as I find little gems in there, I'll share them with you over time. Okay, over here. So we've been working on our, this is, uh, we, uh, we have an online workshop, if you're not aware of it. I'll just tell you quickly where we build furniture. We do three 45 minute episodes each week and we cover the entire build process from design, lumber selection, right through to applying a finish. Just looking around to see, the bench was one of the first things we did, the tool cabinet. Right now we're working on the standing desk and it's been going on a long time, but it doesn't matter, it's not about, it's not about completing it, it's about the process of doing it. So this one has uh, a lot of this, the theme behind it is to hit things to be hidden in plain sight. So you may not be able to tell, but there's three drawers here and you access them from a little uh, hole underneath. Cool. And these are all nicely dovetailed. The uh, white wood is asp, and uh, pardon me, is holly. They're two, two woods. Pardon? The, the, the base, which is white, is a different wood than the Oh, is the are. base aspen? Solid wood? No, no that's plywood. Different. That's birch plywood on the little ones. Anyway, it has a wooden hinge on it. I haven't attached this yet. That's why it's still sitting up here. And then there's two drawers down here. I'll show you this. I always love to show it off. Um, when you open it, there's a little, there's a little um, trap, door. trap door. And you put your finger underneath. I don't know that I showed you on this one. Let me pull it out. So the way you access it, you can see right here, there's a hole. We didn't want to put a handle on there. So there's a little V, a little wooden V underneath. And when you reach in the hole, you just catch that little V with your finger and that's how you open the drawer. Same thing down here. But it's designed to be, uh, to service, a uh, serve as a service counter. So the merchants on that side, the customers over here, documents that might need to be signed would sit here. Customer needs a pen or a pencil, so the uh, merchant opens his drawer without anybody knowing. He closes the little trap door, then he closes the drawer, and out comes this little drawer where the pen and pencil would be sitting if they hadn't been stolen. And it's, the whole idea is to get it to be hidden. Anyway, what we have been working on are the guts to the drawer. So in the drawer, you have your paper, you have your envelopes, you have your legal size envelopes. You have your business cards. You have your pens and pencils, but we wanted something secret. So we have a little compartment under here, not so secret anymore, where you can store a few bills. About three eighths inch worth of something. Three eighths of an inch worth hidden. But just neatly tucked in there. Couldn't keep that secret. Now we're working on this one. By the way, come over and look at this side. The bottom section hasn't been sprayed yet, but this one's hidden a little bit better. I put one coat on everything so that it wouldn't get fingerprints on it while we were working on it. So 
We open this one up, close our little trap door, and out pops your little drawer. There's where the pens and pencils are. So now the, uh, the next task is to go in and decide what we're going to do in this drawer. We've got some ideas. And then we've got to put a little uh, trim all the way around the inside of here to make it easier to clean out. We have to attach that, have to spray the bottom, and then it's done. So if you want to join us, put a link on there for it. Can you do that? Sure. Link to the online workshop. Okay. Am I forgetting anything? I know there's some shout outs I gotta make. Where's Megan? En route. Okay. So if you're a combat wounded vet that has been in our workshop, one of our 13 classes, please say something. Tell them what class you were in so I can give you a shout out. We love to acknowledge you and keep in touch. We're gonna do a little bit of work tonight on Angie's, on Angie's desk and I'll, I have to introduce Angie. So, uh, where's my, where's Angie's picture? Ah! I wonder if it fell behind. Well, no, uh, it wouldn't. There it is, here, 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 here. So Ken Anthony works here with us. Ken's actually the shop foreman. And this is Ken's cousin. Her name is Angie. She's confined to her bed because of a, uh, an illness that's been with her since she was a child. But she's gonna get better. In the meantime, she helps us. She and her sister Lynn package up all the t-shirts. So when you order a t-shirt from us, you'll see a little label on there with an A, that's the seal of approval, and that's Angie. And so what we're doing is we're making a little, a bed desk so that Angie can, because she loves to watch uh, all of our videos, she can set her um, iPad on here and a little drawer because anything I build has to have a drawer in it. We gotta get this to work a little smoother. That's part of tonight. And we need a little lip on there to hold that. And we made it out of pine so it'd be nice and light and be easy to move around. And here's our t-shirts. We have three of them. If you want to help us spread the word, wood is good, wood for good, and wood doing good. Three different colors. The teal one was Angie's favorite. Was, she, she chose that. So let's have a couple of questions. Let's, We're gonna let's start off with doing something. No, I was gonna start off with him. Give me a couple of questions, Frick. I get warmed up. All right. Okay. First one comes from Eric Sicard from Rayleigh, North Carolina. Hey, Eric. And he says, my five and a half plane sides are not 90 degrees to the sole, so my shooting board is off by a couple degrees. Is there a way to grind the side square, or should I just shim the ramp on my shooting board? It looks to be about 0 .007 out. Seven Thanks. thou? Yeah. Okay. So here's the situation. You've got your shooting board, and your plane sits like this. Well, it has to be square, because when you're shooting the end of a piece of wood, unless this is a square setup, then you're not going to have square stock. Now, I actually fixed mine too, it wasn't out much. And I'm gonna show you how I did it. But you have a certain amount of lateral adjustment within your blade. So you can move your blade one way or the other. And that'll give you a little bit. If it's out a lot, well, I'll show you how I did it. I also mentioned this too. Uh, when you build a shooting board, it's always a two-part process. There's the base, which is in this case is MDF because it wears well. And then there is a piece of Baltic birch that is attached, glued to the MDF. And the reason that is there is because your blade does not go all the way to the bottom. So in order for the piece of wood that you're shooting to get into the blade, it has to be elevated this way. That's why we have this, and it also provides you with the fence for making keeping that square set up as you look at it in plan view. Well, come over here. Now, I don't know if you're gonna have the access to this, but we have a, a big, we've got two of them actually, 12 inch disc sanders, and uh, they're not 12 inch, they're 16. 16. So what we did is went in and made sure that this is perfectly square. I've got uh, 120 grit disc. This was actually made for metal. And we simply, I simply go on there with the blade in, of course. And while this is spinning, I move it back and forth. Oh, pardon, pardon me, this way. I move it back and forth 
and it brings this into square with this and we can get it perfect. Now I can do that for you, obviously it wouldn't be free. And if, um, if you need to contact us about no, it. No, we don't, we don't offer that. Oh, Jake says we no. don't offer that. No. We're That's not a mean Jake, shop. mean, mean Jake. If you have it, set it up like that. Even though your disc is spinning like this, you always work only on the downside of your disc. Well, in order to do this, I had to work on both, which means you just have to hold it securely, fingers out of the way. And as you're moving forward and back like that, this area is not doing any cutting, really, because it spins so slowly. It's all about rim speed. This is moving very fast. This is hardly moving at all in here. So you just have to be careful to go, I go, to the extreme left and right so that you even out the wear and then you end up with a bunch of scratches that are running this way which make it a little bit difficult because offers a lot of resistance when you're pushing this on the shooting board so then I just took a piece of sandpaper on a hard block and I sanded it to get rid of those scratches you can if you look real close you can still see, still see a few of them on this side but I don't shoot on that side right I only shoot on the right side of the plane and if it's really bad, you should probably send it back and say, hey, this is, this is uh, out of whack, bad enough. I think it should be replaced. And they probably won't argue with you. Well, he said, I don't know if it was from Wood River. He said it was his five and a half. Yeah. Well, most companies will, will uh, stick to tighter tolerances than that. But every once in a while, a bad one sneaks through. Next, Rick. All right, next one comes from... Stan Moderich from Gold Coast, Queensland, Australia. And it Stan says, down in Australia. Aussie land, yes. Yeah. Can Rob specify the lacquer he uses or even do a session on finishing? Well, actually, Jake and I, just before this started, we were working on a YouTube that will be released on Thursday on finishing. And uh, I'm, so I'm going to show you both. Walk with me, Jake, since you're untethered now. Uh, if you're doing small boxes... You can't use a big sprayer because it, it'll actually blow the little box over. So my favorite finish for small boxes is this product. It's made by Deft. And they have both gloss and semi-gloss. I, I really don't like gloss. It, I don't think you can ever make anything with a gloss look great semi-gloss I would actually prefer low luster or a flat finish but semi-gloss seems to be okay uh, with the it's a wonderful product but what's even better is the spray tip now I'm going to show you what I mean we buy this we buy this uh, about a dozen at a time but the spray tip on this I don't know if, if you see anything interesting about that. You can actually turn that little tip sideways. So it'll either give you a fan that goes this way, or you can turn that tip sideways and it'll give you a fan that goes that way. But when you spray it, it just, uh, it's the, I mean, I've used a lot of different spray cans. It lays a perfect mist on there that is just incredible. Wear a respirator. You're breathing lacquer fumes. So that's what I do for anything small that would otherwise, as I mentioned, get blown off of the uh, tray that you're spraying on. For the large work, furniture, this is the product that I use. And the name has changed. So it's a Chroma Pro. It used to be Becker Chroma, so the name's changed. Uh, Bernal, whatever that's, I don't know how to pronounce that. Intro Clear Pre-Catalyzed Top Coat. 40 gloss so the number determines the sheen and I don't know whether flat is zero or hundred I would as assume a hundred is the high gloss so this would be on the low side um, it's uh, has some water resistance I know this is the only at least 20 years ago when I started with this this was the only lacquer that was certified for use in kitchens in Canada whereas most lacquers don't give you any water resistance at all. We buy it by the five gallon pail. It's uh, a couple of nice things about it is it'll stay in your spray can and not, not solidify on you. Um, you've got to stir it because the flattening agent will be settled to the bottom, so you've got to stir that up. 
You can buy retarder, so a retarder simply slows the drying process. The big plus to this, if we're spraying something, we can, sand, we can spray, scrape, rather than sand, spray, scrape, spray inside of an hour and a half. It's incredible. The downside to that is if it's a large project and uh, four or five feet long, by the time you're done spraying that side, you're getting overspray on this part that's already been dried. So you can buy retarder. And that just, it's a clear liquid. I think you can go up to 15% and it'll slow the drying process down. You can also buy flattening agent, which is simply what makes it a dull finish. You can apply even more to that. So you could take that 40 and you could drop it down to five, if that's, and, if that's the right direction. And vice versa. What? You can add sheen canning. No. Or, no, it no, no, that, that only that drops it down. So if you wanted to, you'd start with clear gloss, and then you could work it from there, anything from there to no gloss. And that, I, I use, uh, just, I'll show you real quick. We just bought a new one. Actually, we didn't buy a new one. Yeah, the, we did. Well, we did, but it's not new because they're out of business. So we, um, I've, I bought this 12 years ago, Turbin Air. They've since gone out of business. And uh, the unit that I have, which is over here, was fine, still works. This is an HVLP, that stands for high velocity, low pressure. And uh, it's nice because I've used the suction, the uh, siphon, not siphon, is it siphon feed? Whatever. And they would just fill the whole room up with mess. So these deliver more product with less overspray. Uh, there's the gun that came with it. My gun, which I loved, got dropped enough times that it was broken and no longer usable. If I can find a replacement for it, I will. This is adequate. So you fill your can up and uh, when you pull the trigger, it'll, it allows pressure to bypass, go into the can and that forces the liquid up. What happened to mine is the hose was full of holes and the can was broken. So we had to get a, we, well actually I was only trying to get the parts, couldn't buy the parts. But I found an outfit in Ontario that actually still had one of these in inventory. A friend of mine, this is at Federated Tool in London, Ontario. So we bought the whole thing and then we have a backup. I hate having to get used to something new, but pretty simple outfit. Anyway, that's what I do for spray finishing. I use the same finish all the time. Last time I used, I sprayed a different finish it was probably 25 years ago. I just recommend people stick with one finish that you get really good at. And the other thing you want to get good at is you want to be able to know how it's going to react with certain woods. I'll give you an example of that. The oil that I prefer to use, since we're talking finishes, I may as well show you that as well, is a product called... It's made by... It's... it's tongue oil, or it's a tongue oil product, circa 1850. Great product, great oil. Um, you would have to have multiple coats in order to get any kind of protection. It's what I use when I do handles. But if you're doing a handle like this, which is white oak, those pores will continue to bleed. So as you're wiping the oil off, you've got to continuously wipe it off for about a half an hour. Or in other words, the little, little beads of oil will come out and harden on the surface, and that's a real pain to try to get rid of them. But done right, it creates a beautiful finish. Next question, Frick. Are you oh, sure? Oh, by the way, Manoli's coming tonight. Our musician. Are you sure you don't want to try and finish the bed desk? We're half an hour in now. Yeah, let's go. We'll who's, who's running this show? We are. Oh, well, huh? now that I know. Okay. <laughs> If we weren't here, it'd be just you talking to the wind. You'd still well, be planing the original boards. <laughs> okay, now you guys are turned into uh, critics and comedians. Um, a couple things I want to do with this. We got to we got to put a little lip on here to keep uh, Angie's desk or uh, her uh, what's it call it? Not laptop. It's iPad. An iPad from sliding off. So I today we go 14 inches long. And how big? Oh, 
I can ask questions while we're doing this, Frick. Do you want an iPad for reference? Yeah, we have an iPad right here. Do you? Yeah. No, it's probably not a bad idea. Which one is that an iPad? That one. Yep. So you flip it over. Like that? No. Here. You put it back like that? Well, that'll give you some... It'll sit there now. Hmm, doesn't even need to... But we'll give her one anyway. So, a half an inch. So we're going to want a lip that's... What did I say? I'm gonna, I, I don't want to be. I don't want to be sitting it on top of the ends of the pins, so that's why we're going to hold it back a little bit. We're going to go 14 by half, and want a decent footprint, so probably five eighths. So I'm going to cut it square first, and then we'll uh, we'll come in and we'll shape it something that is pleasing. So I need pine, a piece eh? of pine. Um, Frick, questions while I'm looking? Okay. Make it an easy yes, no, or something. All right, give me a second then. Thirteen, too small. No, it's probably not. So Dan Johansson from Jamestown, New York, wants to know why don't you have a riving knife? Riving yeah. knife? Riving knife on your table saw. Well, we do. But Jake, answer that question. Since you took it off. The original riving knife that comes on the saw stop is 90 thousandths of an inch. And the thin curved saw blades that we use are 93. I think. So we had to buy the thin curve riving knife from Saw Stop, which means that I have to take the whole riving knife assembly out and adjust it for that drop in thickness. And I haven't. Gotta square this up first. That's the only reason why we don't have it in? Because you haven't decided yeah. to do it? Yeah. Oh, unacceptable. You're gonna get hate mail. Give them your address. When nothing comes by mail. They know my email. Jake at robcosman.com. Frick. No. Should be in there. It's a very um, effective small piece of equipment. All right, let's get this thing. Now, you may also know that we. Uh, we released our adjuster. That's this thing that replaces the adjuster knob on your plane to a huge reception this past week. They sold out in 12 hours. The Wood River version. Right, so we have two versions. We have one that fits Lee Nielsen planes and one that fits Wood River planes, all except for the number four. The Wood River well, planes. Four and below. Because they don't fit a three. Right, right. So they sold out. However, we still have some Lee Nelsons available, and the next batch will be ready in a couple of weeks. So if you have old, tired fingers, or you just prefer that particular adjustment to be a little bit easier, pick one up. You will love it. No, we didn't patent it. We just said, let's just bring it to market. All right, so we've got a flat surface that we then set down on the shooting board and we made the opposite. Next, I'm gonna do another one. 
I'm not gonna push quite so hard. I'm squaring and straightening an edge. Now I'll go over and I'll cut that down to half. With a little bit saved so I can get rid of the saw marks. All right, before we go any further, let's kind of figure what we're gonna do here. Now that looks really clumsy. So how do we go in and, and uh, pare that down? I wonder if you just do something similar to the standing desk. Well, they, don't, they haven't seen the standing desk. So we're, we're, that's what we're gonna talk this through. I would suggest that we probably probably need to introduce a taper on both ends. So I'm thinking something like this. That would, that would soften that side. And we also want to get rid of some of this bulk on the back side. And which one do I want to do first? And what I mean that by that is I want to have some, let's clean this up. I know somebody asked in one of the questions, or one of the questions I read tonight was, uh, why do I use the, why don't I have something here that can adjust to come right to the edge of the plane so I don't have to always be cutting a champ from the backside? And the reason is because eventually this gets worn away, so I just find it easier to just cut your little champ from the backside, then flip it around, and when you plane it off, you won't end up having material break off that far side. I don't think that would work either. What? Well, you could because, you, you could have an adjustable you would, piece. But you would have to have pressure that you apply directly to that wood, to the to the piece right here. Otherwise, in this situation, you were holding it on this end, right? And so that's not holding it tight over here. The plane's doing that. I don't think the fibers would be supported well enough. You could have a piece that was independent, that was screwed on, that you slid sideways like that, and you could bring it right over. But you know what? For the amount of time it takes to go tick, 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 flip it over, you're done. That's probably the reason why I do it. Now, my 5.8 is, I, I, yeah, I get that right. So we're going to have that one like that, and then this one, we're gonna back off Probably should do a similar shape. I don't want to come to a point with pine because it's too easily damaged. So I'll back off. We could come to a point like this though. Yeah, that looks too fragile. And I'm thinking the half inch looks too high up too. You don't, don't, you don't do need it. It doesn't need to be as high as the thing is thick. It just has to be, yeah, I'm going to cut this down. I'm going to cut that down to about there. That's just, that's sticking up from the, from the top too high. Question, Frank. Find something that fits with what we're doing. That would mean that I'm, I should have been paying attention. I'm just kidding. You weren't paying attention? This is a quick one from, uh, quick one from Glenn Edberg in Illinois. He says, are your dovetail saws difficult to sharpen? No. We have a YouTube on that, don't we? Yes. Dovetail saw is very easy to sharpen. You have to make a, uh, you have to make yourself, look, I got it right here. I'll, I'll demonstrate. So if you pick up, Tayfred wrote a series of three books on woodworking. One was on finishing, one was on bending wood, and one was on more or less 
furniture making techniques. And in the furniture make techniques, he shows you how to make this little saw clamp. So it's a couple of pieces of plywood, piece of piece, a uh, couple of hinges. I put these little pieces in here so that when you set it in your vise, it comes out standing, uh, being level. Now a couple of pieces of hardwood. I beveled these so you could have access to it. You'll see what I mean. A couple of pieces of hardwood in here. And then I think I squeezed those like that and ran the saw blade through them or something so that they would come clamp tight. The idea is that you want to have your, I think I did this, made this back when I was sawing Lee Nelson saws. You want your teeth to be well supported. So you want to have just a little bit of the blade up above. Hold it level. Now it seems to me I've had to go in the past and put a clamp here. That's how that's how you support the blade. Then you're going to take a uh, four or a five inch double extra slim taper file. We actually have these, and sooner or later we'll get them on the website. That doesn't work. Oh, I know the problem is try we're trying to find saw handles or file oh. handles. Okay, so that's a three-sided file. You want them to be nice and sharp on the corner. A lot of the times you, you buy them in the hardware store and they're rounded over here and that'll turn your, turn your teeth into waves instead of nice triangular shapes. Now, you want to hold the file the same way with each stroke, meaning you don't want to tip it this way or that. So what you can do is get a, a popsicle stick, essentially, drill a hole in it. You want to put that on there. Now, if you can't, if you can't uh, reference the gullet that's already on your saw, just put something on there like that so that this face is standing plumb. And with it standing plumb, take your popsicle stick and slide it on the end so that you can tell if you're tipping. That popsicle stick will exaggerate it, almost like a winding stick. If you, you may be able to bypass that if you're good. Set that in there, find the gullet, see where it registers. I keep my finger right like that. And then you're gonna take one pass. Now, if you need to, you can take a marking pen and with a, uh, a felt tip marker, you can go in and you can paint all the teeth. Now the advantage of doing that, these are small, they're 15 points or teeth per inch. You don't wanna hit the same one twice because then you're gonna change the shape of that tooth relative to the tooth in front of it and behind it. By painting the teeth, and by the way, you need to have yourself some vision enhancers. So you're gonna get that in there, find the angle. You want the cutting face of the tooth to be plumb. Set that in there. And you're going to, I, have, I don't need to do this because it's a brand new saw, but you're gonna file all the way. And now what I prefer to do is to drag it back and then feel it rise over the tooth and drop into the next gullet and then push forward and come back and do the next one and the black paint will obviously wear off with each one so you'll be able to tell if you've missed one um, you also want there's no fleam there's no angle well there is an angle but there's no let me just say it this way the cutting face of the tooth is 90 degrees to the run of the blade so you're not angling your saw, your file this way. It's staying like that. Now that's something that most people can judge. You can look down and pretty much tell when you're within one or two degrees of being 90 degrees like that. So I start at one end, one stroke, come back, ride over that tooth, drop into the next gullet. The gullet is the space between the points. Do the next one, come back, ride over and go to the next one. Just go all the way down. You'll be able to tell when it's sharp because when you grab it like that, it's, you know they're nice and sharp, it feels sharp. 
If it if it doesn't, if you you don't have that real grabby feel, then you got to go through and do it again. But you always want to make sure that you're filing each tooth, same number of times, same amount of pressure. Start here in the tip and go all the way through, and light to moderate. And I always put, I always aim my pressure probably instead of just straight down. I may be off at about a five degree slope. Each stroke, you're sharpening one side of two teeth. So this is a two-sided sharp edge. You've got the face of one tooth and the top of the same tooth. So with each stroke, I'm sharpening the face of that tooth and the top of that tooth. So same amount of pressure applied all the way through. Probably takes you seven to 10 minutes. Not hard, anybody can do it. If you're not comfortable doing it and you want to send it to us, we'll do it for you. Of course, there's a charge. You're going to pay your shipping both ways. I think we charge $25 to do it. Mm -hmm. But we'll do it. But you can do it. Anybody can do it. Get yourself a pair of these. Huge help. If you can see it, you can do it. Otherwise, it's a guess. All right. Hope that was clear as mud. Now, back to this. So we just cleaned off that face. So I want to go in and I want to cut some shape on that. I still want to do this one, but I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to leave a little bit down here and a little bit up here, probably the same amount. Make that cut just like that. Uh, I could probably do that on the bandsaw just as easy. So let's go over and try that over there. The eensy weensy one. Yeah. Frick, you know you're going gray. You told me that last huh? week. Is it the stress from this job? It started when I married your daughter 13 years ago. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Sure. Blame I'm just, it on us. I'm just kidding. Seems to be when all my problems started, though. And not because of her. Now, I want this on the other side. Since I'm more or less experimenting with this, it's the reason why I'm not looking at any particular angle. So I'm just going to put this in place and s do it until it feels right. Um, as I said, we want to leave material. I want to leave a little bit of flat on this surface and I want to leave a little bit of flat on that surface. What's that look like, Jake? Um, more angle. More slope? Yeah. Keep going. Well, bring the fence over. I wish that thing slid. Okay, right. There? No, nope, more angle. Now bring the fence up. Wait a minute, I gotta tighten this so it won't move. Bring the fence, or bring the table down more. Keep going. Keep going. Seriously? Yeah. More? more? Yep, keep going. All right, now bring the fence up. There? Yeah, try that. Take more off of the here, here, so I need to. Now I'm reaching underneath there. I hope I'm nowhere near the blade. I'm not. Oh, 
That looks good. This is the pine that chokes me up. We just passed our first thousand dollars in donations. Good, excellent. How are we for numbers? 843 right now. How are we for time? We are at 51 minutes and 25 seconds. Have you made contact with Mark? Not yet. Should he be available now? Yeah, you should. You should. I won't be able to do a test call since I'm, we're already live, but I'll be ready. Can I throw a question at you? Yeah. Uh, this comes from Blake Mackison or Mackison. Mackison. Blake? Balake. Balake. Uh, and this is from the chat. And he says, do you have any hints on straightening a saw plate? It is bent. It has a bent top to bottom, so it wanders to one side. Is it, it is almost impossible to make a plumb cut consistently. Uh, hand saw. Say, say, read that again. I was, I was thinking I was a, a table saw blade for some no, reason. No, he has a hand saw that, with the blade that's bent like this. Saw Ooh. plate, yep. Hint on straightening saw plate. R read it to me as he says it again, please. Do you have any hints on straightening a saw plate? It has a bent top to bottom, so it wanders to one side. It is almost impossible to make a plumb cut consistently. Wow. I mean, we deal with... Uh, Front to back. Yeah. Well, first of all... Uh, no harm in trying, because it, can't, it doesn't work as it is. So you can't ruin it. I would, um, without seeing it, which is kind of tough to offer advice, but I would put it in a vise. I would put it in a vise. And bend it the other way? Yeah. Depending on where the bend is. I mean, if the bend is right up there where it's attached, then I would, I would support it right to there. It's a, dovetail, I, it's a dovetail saw, just so you know. It's a dovetail saw? Yeah. Hopefully not mine. Does he, uh, he it's an old Lee Nielsen of my granddad's that I want to restore for my son, he uh, says. Okay, so the Lee Nielsen's are, Lee, the Lee Nielsen's 20 thou, it fits into a single slot. You should be able to do this. Support it right, support it, essentially you want to support it right where the bend is. If the bend is where it's coming right out of the brass, Put it in your vise or just clamp a couple pieces of wood to it. And then what I would do is like that. And then with a mallet, rubber mallet, just tap on that until it bends. And you should be able to bring it back to where you want. You're going to have to just do a little check, do a little and check. But I think, I mean, if it didn't come to you that way because I know Lee Nelson quality and that, that wouldn't have happened. So it's happened after the fact. But you certainly should be able to straighten it. If you want, send me a picture or two, and I will. Uh, I'll try to give you more specific advice because, like I said, I'm trying. I'm guessing at the problem and trying to give you an, a solution to it. Okay, Frick. What do you want? Another one? Yeah. Give me a second. Okay, all the saw marks are off. So, that looks good. And now what we need to do is we need to, we need to uh, cut this down this way. Um, back over to the bandsaw, or should we do it right here? So what I'm thinking we're gonna do, I mean, we're, we're kind of designing as we go. Let me just, uh, let me clear this off first. So I'm gonna come in here and erasing those previous marks. Okay, so since we've got our little flat spot right down to here, then I'm going to, I'm going to bring the next bevel from here down to that mark. So we're going to do something like this. 
I think maybe we can do that just as easily with the bench hook and a super duper crosscut saw. So we want that to be standing plumb on the back side. And I'm just going to hold that. There's where my mark is. Uh, maybe a little more. Okay, now we can do this right on the shooting board. I want to see a little bit better. A couple more. So what I'm doing to find where that needs to be is I'm simply pressing that little flat spot against the sole of the plane and just adjusting it this way until it lays perfectly flat against it. I want to bring this point right to that point. Okay, that's good. Now we got to duplicate it. That's always the problem. So to do that, let's use the protractor. Uh, thank you to Santa Claus. Tonight's giveaway is a Vera Wood, Dave approve this? A Vera Wood dovetail saw with a matching Vera Wood marking gauge. And the Vera Wood will continue to get an emerald green. There's another Vera Wood handle that I've got in the works. It's been cut for a while. You can already see the green that it goes. Where's the big piece, Jake, that we had? There. So here's Vera Wood freshly cut. There's Vera Wood a week later. Oxidized to this incredible emerald green. And if you're looking for a Vera Wood handle and you don't win tonight, I've got enough wood to make several of them, so that's going to be the, uh, the wood of choice for the next little bit. So put your, there's a link on there. You don't have to donate anything in order to participate in the draw. But we do have to have your name. And if you'd like to donate to the Purple Heart Project, we, we would be happy to let you do that. All right, so what I'm going to do is copy this angle. And I'm going to reference off the top. So 28 degrees. Manoli is here, by the way, just... Manoli is? I thought I heard something out there. Jake, uh, Rex, go ask Manoli if he can come in. What time is it? 8 o'clock. Have you got a hold of Mark yet? I can try calling him whenever. All right, go ask Manoli if he'll come in in the next five minutes and give us a, a number, an original tune. To set up that microphone there, Rex. So what I'm going to do is, same as I did on the last one, find my, uh, find that spot. Now, we, we still have Jake's guitar here. Because we're sending it with a bandsaw we're shipping to them. How come that doesn't look right, Jake? It looks way too. Well, yeah, long. you know what? You know what? It's a lot easier. I don't know why I didn't just do that. Is um, just measure where one angle starts. This stuff is really punky. 
Oh, I shouldn't say punky, just soft. Yeah, I'm gonna try using my uh, block plane with that small shooting board. Sometimes when you're dealing with little small pieces, it's easier using this. a question yeah okay this one comes from michael tucker in the chat he said good morning rob just received my dovetail saw this morning i got the regular grip as my hand is nine centimeters at the knuckle on my palm side can you show me your grip how, oh how i hold it yeah certainly so, since everybody here is going to be wanting to order a dovetail saw sooner or later, here's how you measure for it. So, with your outstretched palm, you want to measure from there to here. So, on my hand, it comes in at three and a half inches. As long as you're under four, the regular handle will fit you fine. If you're over four, then you need us to make you a large handle. And this is the way that I hold the saw. It's a three finger open pistol grip. That's why those little indents there, they're for your, hand, your fingers. Your f index finger lays over here because with your index finger and thumb, that gives you some real, if you hold it like that, you don't have a lot of stability. But holding it like that, you get a lot of lateral stability in the saw. And it should be a nice, comfortable grip. If you've ever held a baby's hand, how hard do you have to hold it to keep them from pulling away without hurting them? And that's about how much, how, 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 hold you, how hard you grip the saw. Okay, so a three finger open pistol grip. When we make the hand, we make these a full inch. The saw that I used to sell was three quarter and I always felt like it was just a little bit small for an adult male hand. Now, seven sixteenths is where I need to be. I don't know how I managed to do that because it was way off. Okay, now we've got to saw it and how am I going to do this? Holding it the opposite way. Can you cut it off the end of the bench? Hmm? I can maybe do it like this. I can use the uh, shooting board or the bench hook as a uh, reference for vertical. Oh, that's not gonna work. This is this is a uh, reason why I should practice with my left hand. My mother-in-law hears me say that. She being a southpaw. Yeah, we got it. All right, let's do this. Is that at the same angle as the other one? I don't know. It appears more stout. Well, you know why? Oh yeah, it is. Well, we'll just adjust it. I need just a little more blade. OK. 
Okay. Yeah, I got to tip it this way just a little bit because this is not a rectangle like it should be. Okay, that looks all right. No, this is a little smaller. So that means I'm going to take this down a little bit more. Okay, now we got to clean up the inside. Now, when you're planing something this flimsy, you almost have to push directly across from the blade in order for it to make contact. Brother. Okay. Okay. Now uh, that's that's a point, and I I don't want that because that's just too susceptible to being damaged. So I'm just gonna flatten that off a little bit. Wait, Ronnie, just lay what? it on the shooting board. Oh yeah, yeah, good. <coughs> That'll keep it square. So Rick, did you get a hold of Mark? I will try right now. Or, or you wait and do it while Manoli's playing. Yeah, I'll do that just because it'll make noise on the. Manoli, you ready? Yeah. Got something original? Well, I was thinking of this. Uh, are we live right now? What? We're live. Of course. We are live. <laughs> I was thinking I wanted to play a little bit of a blues guitar thing with this guitar. To see it. I made up an original blues. A blues song because you have to watch it go. Take it away.
Where we head to Las Vegas on Christmas Day. Where we're drowned to Las Vegas. Get to the buffet. Well, I will leave it now, baby. Tears in my eyes. Well, I'm leaving now, baby. Tears in my eyes. You see, a woman always knows when a man. Yeah, I made that up there for you. Did you uh, did you write that one for uh, my brother Dave's birthday, which is today? I did not. You want to? <laughs> I wrote that one about your brother Randall. Oh, we Randall. Had a trip down to uh, well, I had Utah? a friend come out. Yeah, we went to Utah, and we 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 got a friend of mine came out to visit Kim, and, and we all drove down there through a couple states and got into Utah late Christmas Eve. And he knocked, where are we going to stay? And couldn't find a place. And he called, a, uh, knocked on an ex companion of his door, and they let us stay there. And the next day we got to uh, Vegas pretty early, Christmas buffet. Randy was, was heading to a buffet. <laughs> he, would, he would drive. He shotgun there. He would, he would drive a long distance <laughs> for a buffet. <laughs> Happy birthday, Chark. Happy birthday, Dave. Thank you. Thanks, Molly. We'll get you. You'll be back, right? Yeah, I have something else. All right, go All write right. another one. <laughs> okay, so, Frick, question? I'm working on getting Mark. You're working on getting Mark? All right. Send I think it. this is ready to glue on. <laughs> I don't think there's anything else that we need to do. <coughs> now, what I'm going to do is, I think the best thing to do is to follow this line at the bottom of that pin. To me, that just looks better than if you set it up there in the middle of the pin. For some reason, I just like being on that same line. And... I got him. You what? I got him. You got him? Is he ready? I think so. All right, well, give me just a minute. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to glue this on, and then... Uh, and that will give us a little bit of time now what i should do is put this square actually i'm gonna have to put it up there and i can reference against it so I'm just eyeballing that. And if I eyeball that on that side, hopefully they're in the same place. That looks good. Move it over a little bit. A little bit more. Okay. Okay, Jake, Jake, mm -hmm. hand me, uh, I need two clamps. No, I need the small ones, yeah. Not that one, I hate it. Yeah, those two. Yep. I'm going to need you to turn it. Snug? Snug enough. My phone? Maybe. Okay. Right there. Now, how are we going to clamp? Well, actually, you know what? We should be able to clamp. Pushing against that square and the rule. 
Well, I'm just worried about leaving marks on the uh, on that piece of pine. This isn't much in terms of protection, but pine will mark breathing on us. Now I've got to have some kind of a reference point. I should have put that Okay, uh, those little clamps, you think they'll hold it? Oh all yeah. Needs. If not those, the bigger ones definitely would. <coughs> That'll do, good. All right. Don't want- the one that's full. Yeah, don't want too much glue. <coughs> Run a pass down the middle. So Manoli lived with my brother, well, lived and worked with my brother Randy out in Alberta for a number of years. They were more like siblings. And did they leave Alberta this one time? I think they were asked to leave actually. That's when Randy had dreads. Okay. So you're about to hear from Mark Wachowski. And Mark came to our class uh, how long ago, he Jake? He was actually in Super Dave's class. Was he in Super Dave's class? Oh. Dave would say that that uh, Mark probably learned a lot from Super Dave. <laughs> and Super so, Dave and, Dave and Mark would probably say, uh, "Who is Super Dave? Which one was he?" Super Dave's not on tonight, so. So we can make fun of him. Exactly. Now, I, I like these clamps because they've got, I mean, there's a cheap clamp, but they've got pivoting jaws, so they'll conform to this shape. All right, that's, that's it, come on over here. So Mark, great guy. I'm gonna let him do the, uh, do the introduction. He's gonna tell you a whole lot about himself. You there, Mark, you hear me? I, I am, Rob. All right. Take it away, please. Right on. So uh, thank you, Rob, number one, you and your team for everything you guys do. You're amazing. So my name's Mark Bukowski. Um, I did 26 years in the Navy. 20 of that was in uh, explosive ordnance disposal, which is uh, also called EOD. So our my main job back then was I was a mine diver. Uh, d dove on mines, but... And 11 happened, everything turned into land warfare, really. So, so what I did back uh, then after after 9-11 is we, we disarmed basically IEDs, um, improvised explosive devices or, or terrorist bombs. Um, when we, you know, went to go visit people in various countries and different places, bad folks. And uh, so that was kind of what I did uh, a, a while ago. <clears throat> Uh, in all, I probably did over, I don't know, over 100 direct action missions, which are uh, just the name of basically counter-terrorist missions. Uh, currently, I'm a, I'm a single dad with my 12-year-old daughter. Blessed to have her with me. Um, so the, the crux of the whole thing and what Rob does, um, 
talk about everything is is kind of PTSD, right, or post traumatic stress disorder. So, in a nutshell, that's that's a struggle that a lot of service members have to deal with, and it affects everyone differently. So, it's not the same for everyone, and, and it comes from different places. So, sometimes it's uh, it's something that you you witnessed, or something you went through, or or sometimes it's something that you did yourself. You know, it it just it's not the same. There's not a definition of it. But it's something that's very real and very it affects people greatly, um, and a lot of it's you know in your head. A lot of it. Well, and then there's the physical aspect of it too. I mean, there's 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 people. There's a guy in my class when I was going through Rob's tutelage, which was amazing. Um, that you know was missing limbs. Right? He's hopping up on the table, working on wood, and that's a whole different aspect of it. But still ties into the whole whole big picture of being wounded one way or the other and having to overcome it. And uh, Rob's program is is amazing at that. So, um, one of the things that tie into that with uh, PTSD is 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 the mental part. A lot of it, right? So a lot of people don't win that mental part. A lot of people are overwhelmed with coming back and having. Uh, having to have dealt with things that they weren't prepared to or don't know how to deal with, right? And so mentally, they get overwhelmed, and I've lost a lot of friends to, to suicide, which is horrible. But it's very real, and uh, it's it's something that's there. So these people, um, you know, have gone out and either witnessed or seen or had to just deal with things themselves, had to do things that, you know, at the, at the time you don't think about, but years later can really start to eat away at you and when you're alone and don't have an outlet for you know trying to focus on positive things it can wear you down so hobbies friends families those are things that that help you and a lot of folks a lot of service folks don't have that right not all the time and you kind of get lost in the weeds sometimes so a lot of these folks don't even want to say anything so you know, you're always proud. You just, you, you can handle things yourself. And a lot of times you can't. But you're, you know, you got too much pride sometimes to say anything. So, woodworking was something that I realized is something that can take you away, make you focus on things. And that's very important. So there's, there's many things that can help you do that, but woodworking was one of them that, creates uh, an environment where you know you need to your total attention is focused on it now, I just got sitting done sitting there listening to Rob talk like I I enjoy watching him <laughs> work and talk because it's just captivating so when you're working on something like that you're totally focused on it and that helps these people myself included focus on other things and gives you a positive outlet right so you get a look at things create things and and work on things that totally take you away from having to think about things that might be bothering you. So what Rob provides in his environment is is exactly that, which is invaluable, right? Just woodworking. As simple as you would think it is, it's 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 an amazing thing. And what Rob has going is, is an amazing outlet for these vets. Um I I was blessed to be able to attend Rob's things uh, course a couple years ago and it still sticks with me today and I still work on it today um, I've built <laughs> many different things not as many as I'd like to that are you know directly attributable, attributable, attributable to what I learned in Rob's courses um, so I can't say enough about that um, if you are in a position to be able to donate to support Rob's efforts in any way, shape, or form um, his Purple Heart program that will directly help struggling people that, that that need help, whether they know it or not right now. That's sometimes the hard part is getting them pointed in the right direction and realize that they have an outlet, right? But once we get them there, the fact that they have something available to get them going is, is huge, and that's what Rob is doing. So if you can contribute to that, it's 
amazing thing that you can do. Sometimes it's harder to, to look at it and be able to realize what you're doing, but trust me, whatever you can do in any way, shape, or form by contributing is directly influencing someone's life. It really is. I can tell you 100%. Um, in a very profound way. So like I said, I was extremely fortunate to have been able to stumble across Rob and be able to reap the benefits from what he did. And <clears throat> the bigger thing is, so you, you learn these skills, and that's that's top notch, you know, that lasts a lifetime. As long as you practice it. I'm getting a little rusty on a couple of things, Rob, my sharpening. I'll tune up on that. Um, but these guys have, you know, forgotten more than we'll ever know. They're extremely talented and just amazing. Um but the uh, the friendships that you that we met there, that the folks that Rob had there, and just the experiences were, were amazing, you know. And that stuff will last a lifetime for for the people that are involved with these types of things. But the uh, the lessons learned and the friendships will last an eternity, right? More than a lifetime, in my opinion. So once again, I, I, there's not much more I can I can say <laughs> the word I, I don't have words to really put into how important I think Rob's program is and by contributing what you can provide to people that are really in need um, but if you can and I ever run across you believe me I, I definitely owe you a beer or a soda pop or whatever it is that you, you particularly want I'll, I'll definitely buy you one because you're, you're helping out more than you could ever realize by uh contributing or being part of his program mark do you do you remember how you found out about it um yeah i sure do i was simply looking at uh i started uh, i I really knew nothing i knew a little bit about work very little but i was actually i stumbled across one of your videos and it was either a plane it was something wrong i don't even remember if it was a plane or a saw i was watching some of your dovetail videos and I called to buy something, and I think I was talking to Jake, I don't remember, and I was just talking to him, asking how much something was or, or how something worked, I don't even remember. And out of the blue, you jumped on the phone because I think you asked if I was military, I don't even remember, and I would mentioned that I was, and you jumped on the phone right away, and it's just threw your program thing at me, it was like, hey, <laughs> and uh, got me going on that, I was like, I was kind of taken aback a little bit by it. And then uh, next thing I know, I was talking to Luther. And, uh, you know, we went from there, and it was it was amazing. And I'm totally blessed to have been part of that. I really am. And I thank you. You're welcome. Mark's actually going to come back. We, uh, we've we extended our, pro- our Purple Heart Project to uh, bring former, um, what do we call them? Students. No. No, what's Luther's term? Repeat offenders. <laughs> yeah. What does Luther call them? I can't. No, no, no. Uh, scholarship. Recipients? Yeah. Hey, he's got a word. I can't think of it. Former vets that have been to our class, we're going to bring them back. Each time we're going to bring one in, and he's going to work as our assistant. So Mark is coming back. His was uh, interrupted by COVID, but next year, same month, he's going to come up. So... Some lucky 14 people will get to meet him. And I'm going to take the day off on dovetails. Mark's going to cover that. <laughs> oh, man, that would be great. Well, they, they need to see some of your stuff because actually you've made quite a bit with those uh, cabinets that yeah. hide the ordinance. Yeah, 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 or web, yeah, yeah. Cool. Those are downstairs, but yeah, I'll bring some pictures. Thank you, Mark. Appreciate you doing this in short notice. Thank you, Rob. No, anytime. Great. Wonderful having you. I can't look forward to having you back. Right on. Thanks, man. I appreciate it. Love watching you. Take care. You too. That was a that was a really good class. Was it Ivan? Is that no? Jeff? Or uh, who who was the injured? Which one was it? Oh, was it Jeremy? Really? In that class, we had Jeremy, Tyler, Super Dave, Mark. Oh, that was a good class. Aaron. So Jeremy Brees was uh, was a sniper, U.S. Army, 
and he'd stepped on a landmine and lost both legs above the knee. And, uh, and Jeremy was, uh, I mean, Jeremy put everybody with all four limbs to shame because his dovetails were so good. Uh, I was thoroughly impressed. And Jeremy just recently received his bench. In fact, Jack, Jack Lane built Jeremy's bench and delivered it to him. So if you want to see that, go on that uh, Facebook link and check it out, and you'll see where Jack and his, who did he take with him? Is it his wife? Wife or daughter, I can't remember. Yeah, and they drove it up and delivered it to Jeremy and, and, uh, and his wife, Roxy. I think his son was there too. All right, so that's, that is drying. I think I can take this part off. Frick, throw a question at me. Give me one second, I'm working on something. Rex, you want to go get Manoli? Ask him to come back in about five minutes. We're going to try to get three songs out of him tonight. Three songs? Three songs? What else are we going to get out of you? Well, I'm still going. All right, I gotta cut chamfers a little heavier all around this. There's one more thing that's bothering me that I'd like to take care of, if I can figure out, and that's that gap down there, but maybe it's best left undone. Well, it's not terribly noticeable. And we gotta get the drawer, we gotta get the drawer uh, fitting there's a little some bit better. Of these surfaces there's, that don't there's, have any there's a little tight spot, yeah, I know. I'm going to go through, I'm going to take my block plane and put a new edge on that so I can get as clean, as clean a uh, chamfer as possible. Now, if you haven't seen this, you're going to see it right now. I'm going to sharpen using the most expensive of all the sharpening systems. This is the Shapton. We're get we're uh, we're getting another phone call here. Phone from yeah. who? Can you come take it? It's what? Okay. Who is it? Oh, <laughs> it's Felix. Then <laughs> <laughs> you hey, chose Russell. you chose the night that Dave's not here. I know. Uh, yeah, I uh, I talked to Dave and he didn't answer me back, but I've got my. Uh, my little Antifa cat here hacked the uh, system for me and got me in on the feed. <laughs> <laughs> so this is Danny Bell. Danny was in our class a year ago, a year ago coming up. And Danny runs a business down in Clarksville, Tennessee called uh, you can do it, Rob. Hard, you can do it, Rob. Hardwood Grove. Yeah. Check them out. And go watch his videos. He does a lot of these river tables, and I was watching him the other day. Really cool. He has his wife filming. Tortures her like I torture Jake. And that's the infamous yeah. cat that peed all over Super Dave's belongings. Yeah. We call him the Antifa cat because he likes to destroy people's property. Yeah, he's got that look in his eye, too. He does. Oh, Dave will love that. Yeah. <laughs> I got to go back to work. Wait. Well, oh, so, what, what, so what, Rob, what? I kind of busted in here on you Pardon? for a reason. I busted in on you for a reason. Go. Uh, I'm kind of piggybacking off of uh, what he was just talking about. Mark? Yep. Um, <clears throat> so my name's Danny Bell, and I was, again, blessed enough to show up to the uh, Purple Heart Project in October of last year. Uh, for those of you who are watching, if you may be vets or if you know somebody who, who is applying... Um, I was actually a third time application. I was accepted on my third try. So don't don't allow uh, a no or a not right now to not let you reapply because it's not a uh, hierarchy of who deserves it more. It's just a matter of um, you know circumstance. But it's if you're eligible, you're eligible, and it's not a it's not a you're not good enough thing based on your issue or your severity. So don't. So I, I'll say that first. Uh, to piggyback off of what Mark said, um, it's difficult to describe in words to people who haven't experienced it. But if I can add a few key points that, you know, Rob is, is one person, he's one guy who has become a central hub for this thing. And we call ourselves, uh, we, 
you know, cosmonites or the cosmon nation is really what we're starting to refer to. Cosmonauts as, uh, is the proper term. You know, to, to Rob, it's uh, it's what he does. It's his passion. And he's uh, now that's permeated his whole family. And what they've done is they've created something out of nothing just based on a need. They saw a need and they are using their skills and talents and they're creating this thing. So now this thing exists and it's become a, not only a hub, but a place for people to seek out. And every person who goes to it gets touched in the exact same way. And that's how you know it's such a special thing. Whether you're a civilian or you're a veteran that gets to go to this thing, uh, you walk away with it with this connection. And you've, you've got a new understanding and a connection for, for the woodworking as a, as a therapy. You know, I woodworked for 19 years before I ever thought of it as a therapy. And that's completely changed my life. Um, going to the program changed my life in such a way that it, it actually changed the trajectory of what I do on a daily basis. And I didn't know that that was coming. And, and everybody has their own walk that, they, that they're doing. But for me, it definitely changed my life. I've oriented things in order to contribute, uh, not only with Rob, but, but however I can with people locally where I'm at. Uh, down here at Fort Campbell, and uh, and I believe that everybody who comes here walks away with that same sort of renewed kinship to help other people because you can leave the military and, <clears throat> and you get in these little groups or you isolate yourself and then you're exposed to these people who are so giving and, uh, and they want nothing in return. And uh, every time I talk to people about this, matter of fact, today I had uh, two people in the store. I was telling telling about Rob and, and about the program, and, and and they were both vets, and they were both seeking something. They wanted to come in. They discovered woodworking as a way of helping themselves, and I started talking to them about the program, and that they always want to know what's the catch. There's really nothing that we can do as veterans to uh, reciprocate the impact that you have left on our lives. And uh, the small measure of something that we could do is just try to put together and give back in the best way that we can. Um, so we're making those efforts as we can. And uh, with that, we would uh, like to, you know, present to you, back to you, a very, very small token of our appreciation. And uh, it's really the least we can do. It doesn't measure up to a, a single word of what I've said. But uh, from all of your bets... Uh, past and for the future, this is just a small morsel of what we would like to just just give something back to you and tell you that we love you, and that you affect our lives in uh, many more. I, I bet I've touched thousands of people personally with your message and with your program, and and I, you know it's just changed my life, and I'm one of a you know of, of dozens now. And everybody does it the same. I'm nobody special in this journey. We all have experienced you. And from us to you, thank you. Uh, you save people's lives. You know, there's people in our groups who save people's lives in combat situations. And uh, and you, Rob, and, and Jake, and Frick, and Megan, and, and everybody there, you guys have saved guys' lives. I mean, Kevin, Kevin Burris was in my class, you know. And uh, I remember watching him just being quiet. And then by the end of the second day, we're shooting the poo you know he was the bench right next to mine and uh, i still talk to Derek burnett on a on a couple times a week he comes to my house almost every weekend he has to make it home in time to watch the show but uh you really are making connections with people and saving people's lives and changing people's lives and for that we, we gotta say thank you <clears throat> so uh oh <laughs> so these are. This is a, a big one and a little bit different version of the cool. ones that are going on all the benches from the bench brigade. Um, Josh Faust made it for you, Jacqueline. Well, thank you, Josh. I've seen those and wanted one. Cosmination, thanks for your service to all our veterans. Wow. Oh, they. That's inlaid too. Not inlaid. I think it's laser. No. This. That. That is inlaid on. Oh, the plane. On, on the plane. Yeah. Wow, that's that's cool. Thank you, Danny Bell. Thank you. Thank you. I mean, uh, I always uh, get somewhat embarrassed when you guys lay on your should 
Should men only play some blues? <laughs> yep. <laughs> Thank you, Dan. You're welcome. Gary says hi. He just texted me and said to tell you hi. He's in the Tennessee mountains, so he couldn't be watching tonight, but he's thinking about you too. It's, it's not the same without Gary on. <laughs> we'll, we'll find a good place for that. Well, we'll talk to you soon, and thank you guys for asking me to do this. It was a, a pleasure, and I, I hope I get to speak for all the vets and uh, say thank you, and we love you guys. Thanks, Danny. You're welcome. Thank you, Felix. <laughs> all right, Manoli's back. See you, Dan. Can you remind me whose guitar I'm playing? Uh, this guitar is going to be on its way to Jake Tarola. It was made by Paul Rigney. Rigney of the East Tennessee Luthiers Guild. And Jake is a combat wounded vet that uh, we felt was deserving of it. So all of the proceeds on our last episode, our last live broadcast went to... Uh, um, securing it and we're sending it out to Jake. And it, as with any guitar, it takes a little bit to settle in the wood and it's, this guitar settled just perfect. Aged like fine wine. Around all this nice wood. And a long buffet table. Well, here's a song I wrote a long time ago, actually, not too long ago, around the time a movie called Gangs in New York came out, if anybody remembers it. I'm a big fan of Americana. There's a movie that took place around the uh, 1860s, Potato Famine. And I myself was going through a bit of a hard time when the movie came out. So I think I'm guessing around 2006 or four, I'm not sure. <laughs> Don't take the Bowery boys to the brothel. They'll bring the medicine home to you. Walking through a tombstone. I've tried to make my bones And I'm tired of feeling stoned And sitting all alone I Gotta find a phone to call the man I thought that my withdrawal was a bad one I lost the best friend if I had one Walking through tombstones I've tried to make my bones I'm tired of feeling stone Sitting here all alone Gotta find a phone to call God be with me one more day. I got a crucifix to carry. I, I'm tired of all your lies and your pride. You won't blind my bedroom eyes.
clapping or did you get the? He's got the applause going. There you go. Yeah. Thank you, brother. Yeah, thank Finish you. Finish it off tonight. The last thing we'll do, we have you one more song right after we do our draw. Sure. <clears throat> you got about uh, 15 minutes to finish that. Yeah, we'll have to finish that. Yeah. 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 Y
get a CBN wheel. It's really expensive in comparison to a traditional stone, but it works so much better, the cost is justified. Set that down on the primary, come up just a little bit higher, little tight circles. And I'm moving on the stone front to back just to even out the wear. Do that for about 10 seconds or until you can pick up a slight burr on the back side. And I don't feel it yet. As soon as you do, step over here to the 16,000. Repeat the process, except I've elevated the blade to be a degree or two higher than the previous stone. So the only part touching the stone is the very leading edge. That cuts the amount of time down on an otherwise very slow cutting stone. This is 16,000 grit versus 500 grit. And if that doesn't register, if that doesn't uh, ring, if you don't understand what I just said, imagine a one inch by one inch screen that has 500 little holes. That's the grit particle size here. Now imagine that same one inch screen with 16,000 holes. That's the grit particle over here, particle size. Now what I'm doing, I've got my little steel rule in here. This is the, infam the famous, why do I say infamous all the time? Charlesworth ruler trick. So little steel rule on the side, lay the blade down on its back, stay within a quarter of an inch of the opposite edge, and just run that forward and back for a few seconds. In this case, I'm just deburring. And now that Never is... Never any feathering as well. Huh? Oh, yeah, on doing a block plane, there's no reason to dress or feather the outside edges. Now, this, if you're not familiar with block planes, whereas a normal bench plane, the bevel's on the bottom side, and the angle that you put under here really does not impact the performance of the tool. On a block plane with the bevel on the top side, the angle that you put on the blade will change the performance of the tool, at least the performance of the cut or the characteristics of the cut. That could actually be tightened up just a little bit. All right, now, before I do it on this, I want to check it on a piece of scrap just to see how much of a cut I'm making. All right, that's good. Now, I think we can take this off. Has that been on there 20 minutes? Oh, yeah. How come time flies when we're doing this? It must be because we're having fun. Be the only reason. Wait, who's having fun? You, Frick, you're over there stuffing your face. What are you, got a buffet going on? Some shrimp pad thai this evening. Mm, sounds good. Now hold that at a 45. And just because of the nature of this wood, I'm going to make this chamfer a little bit bigger than I would otherwise. And we'll run across the top. Won't that create a, po create a point going at that angle? Yeah, no, it's flattened out quite a bit. I should be going this way. Gotta see these. A couple more. Now up this one. Turning, I should be going, my plane going this way so that it cleans. How can I explain that? That last piece of wood, if you're aiming this way, it, fibers have a tendency to push off that way. 
Just a, just a second. We lost the video, Jake. Check the... Uh, you lost the video? Yeah, I'm on. I got a flashing light here, just a second. Are we, are we not? I'm we're, on. We're, we're still live, they can hear us. I'm just... Uh, All right, let Frick's working on the uh, feed. I've got a red now. Just a second. All right. You want to shut it off? Now. Shut off your receiver. Oh, Can there I? we go. We're back. Oh. Okay. Well, we're not now. You just turned it off again? Yeah. All right, give it a sec. Do we have audio? Yeah, we have audio. All right, so I'm, going, I'm doing the back corner of the side panel now. And I'm just doing this by eye so that all of them are the same. There we connected. go. Yeah, we're back. Same widths. Now I want to do one along the bottom as well. Super Dave has joined us. Who? Super Dave has joined us. He lives. Ah. Was, you know, it, was, you know it, was it Felix that brought him on? Yeah. He joined so he could enter the draw to pick <laughs> up all that very wood. Can't stand as out of somebody else having one. Just wait till he finds out that it's his we're selling. <laughs> Just wait till he finds out it's his we're giving away. We'll forward the address to him to send it. Thank you. I should introduce the prize again. So, Santa Claus and his wife are supplying, paying for, tonight's prize. And it is a Verwood, this is one, one drawing, two pieces. I'm going to put it in the vise and try it. This is a Vera wood, and if you don't know what Vera wood, it's also known as Argentine lignum. 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 Yes, thank you, that's the glue. It uh, has a beautiful smell, and there's the color of the wood as it oxidizes. Flip it over. There's where it came when it was freshly cut and turned upside down. That was the part that was exposed to the air. So you see the color. And that's stained green, right? We brush that on afterward? No. Now, it's extremely heavy. In fact, is it the heaviest wood we? No. What's heavier? Catalogs. Catalogs? But this is a close second. Yeah. So there it is, the dovetail saw. And it should cut like a dream. <laughs> Almost needs brakes, it's so fast. <laughs> Tested and approved. And along with that Vera wood, in a box made by none other than our newest employee, Harold Snodgrass. Harold was a longtime cabinet maker here in Grand Bay. Came to work for us a couple months ago. And I rumor has it he loves it here. He also, we, oh shoot, yeah. Yeah, I was gonna say. We yeah, the whirly to, bird, now I'll have to bring it up next, next time. time. Um, the whirly, the, the whirly twirly, is that what you call it? I can't remember. So there's your marking gauge. Nice and sharp, deadly accurate, beautiful piece of wood. Make a lovely gift. All you gotta do is 
Put your name in the hat. Now. We have well over uh, 600 names this time. It's the most we've ever had for a really? draw. Really? Yep. Oh, that's, that's good. So if everybody made a small donation, I'd feel a lot more better. A, a, a lot more a lot better? More better. A, lot, a lot more better. A lot more better. Santa Claus donating $1,200 the cost of this. And we have how much in donations? 2400 She's counting them. 2200 2200 all right, folks, step up. You heard from uh, two of them tonight. By the way, Danny Bell was a uh, Chinook helicopter pilot. Oh, look at that glue. I've got to do the inside. I, I, I'll get that off. And can, Danny is being medically retired in I think it's November? I thought it was him. Okay, we've got a chamfer. Oh, I've got to do this one. Okay, that covers all of them. How are we for time? Oh, shoot, we're out of time. Yeah, you know, nobody's dropping off. I would like to get this final fit. But it's got to be waxed too, so that's going to make an impact. There's just a little bit. Is it the top? No, we already checked that. There's just a little bit of snugness right at the very end. And the the f drawer front has to be fit. Did, did I wax the sides last time? I don't think so. No, the drawer front is perfectly set, purposely set back in. Yeah, but it looks like it's set back a lot more on one side. No. Uh, maybe. Maybe just a little. I don't have time to do it. So I'm going to leave it at that. I'll do the final fit in the drawer. I'll spray it. And uh, if we still have it around, we'll show it to you next time before we deliver it off to Angie. All right. Are we ready for our draw? Hey, look, throw me a couple more questions. I'm in the mood. A couple. Yeah, we'll just go another well, 30, 40 minutes. Oh, come on. You guys are eating. I'm go done ahead. now. Go ahead, Frank. Oh, yeah, he's done. Well, he's dessert, dessert, dessert's coming. Oh, wait. I had a... Just a second. Shoot, I had a good one from the chat. Uh, you what? Something about you when you were planing. Darn it, I lost it. Oh, why do you drag the block plane backwards on the material after you push cut? Well, good question. Let me give you a good answer. L Luther gave an answer, too, but... Uh, if you're, if you're doing this, okay, now I'm doing this by eye, and I want that little chamfer to be uniform. If you're going here, picking it up, coming back down, setting it back down, chances of you setting that on the same angle every time are very slim. They're slim enough doing it this way and making contact all the way back, but you got a heck of a lot better chance maintaining it that way than you do over, off, back on. So that's the primary reason. When I'm using a large plane to uh, plane things, I tend to keep the plane engaged the whole time just so I don't have to lift it up every time. And if you think it's hurting your blade, no, wrong, wrong. Not hurting your blade at all. Question? How many weeks, or how, sorry, how many hours a week do you work in the shop? That one comes from Chris in the chat. Three. Um, quite a few. Well, this way. I get out of bed. I come here. I usually eat breakfast here. I don't make it home usually for lunch or supper. My wife and kids come down here and work and visit. I leave here at, uh, it's always after midnight. It's usually closer to one or two. And I go home. And if I don't do a bit of email, I go to bed. So... And now, this is not normal. We have been uh, extremely busy, and sales are through the roof. We, we make and sell more dovetail saws in a week than we used to do in, in um, a year. So, yeah, but I love it. I enjoy it. I enjoy it. 
Actually, let me rephrase that. I like it. I love my wife. I like my work. Question number three. Hmm. Best advice, that advice, by the way, came from Del Griffith. If you remember Planes, Trains, and Automobiles, part was played by John Candy, and that was his best piece of advice. <clears throat> like your work, love your wife. All right. This one comes from uh, Mike Oban in Oakland, Rhode Island. He says, what is the wax you use when masking the dowels during glue-up on a wood hinge box? Uh, not that it's, uh, not that it's uh, anything in particular. I just happen to like it because it's, it's in a small Wait. container. What? That's you. That's me? No, sorry. It's in a small, convenient container, but is there, it is a nice wax. It's called Renaissance. I got it from Woodcraft. It's a micro and crystalline. it's expensive. It's $30 for that little container. I think that's the one that I used. I didn't do it. Get it out of your pocket. Remote. One more question, Frick. This is your last chance to participate. I don't have it. What? <laughs> I, I said it over there. A technical issue that doesn't have to do with me. That's good. What? Um, okay, this comes from uh, our good friend, Abraham Pinsky. Over Question in Israel? Yeah, over in Israel. Question for Rob. Can you show us how to hold the chisel when the wood is standing up in the vise? I tend to slice the fingers on my supporting left hand. Okay, ask that again because I'm trying to envision what he means. Okay. Can you show put us how to hold down. a chisel when the wood is standing up in the vise? I tend to slice my fingers on the supporting put left the, hand. Put that dovetail, or the, the somewhat cut dovetail, as if you're paring it. Oh, going across the top? Yeah. Not, I, I wouldn't say across the top. I would say cleaning out the oh, cleaning out cleaning the So I'm like this. Yeah, come over on this side. I'm gonna get it top view. So I hold it firmly like this. So I'm squeezing like that. Index finger lays against the face of the vise, so I have lots of control. And I'm pushing down, and this hand is supporting it underneath, and it goes into my palm, and that's where the force comes in pushing. But I'm squeezing it like that. Now. These edges, there's a little flat landing. This is a nice thing about uh, uh, um, the IBC chisels. There's a little flat landing Lee right Nielsen there. Lee Nelson Wood River. Lee Nelson well. does it as well. And the Wood River, yes. This is the nice thing about a well designed chisel. Yes. Thank you. Why don't you answer the whole thing, Jake? Keep going. All right. You're doing all right. But when you flatten and prepare your back, that makes this very sharp right here. So you want to be careful with that. Now, I've got enough calluses, I don't, doesn't bother me. But if you don't do this often, that may very well be an issue. So I'm just, I'm squeezing it like that, and that probably protects it somewhat. But yeah, they're sharp. All right. Wait, last question. What is Colonel Potter's horse's name? Sophie. Come on. What was that from Super Give me, Dave? Yeah. Luther. What, what kind of a lame... Luther. Oh, Luther, of course. Well, I don't know if someone else asked it in the chat, but Luther forwarded it to me. All right. How, what, the, what, are, where, where are our numbers? Uh, 1,047 right now. How much? 1,051. 1,051. How many people are in the draw? Let's check real quick. We are currently at... 563. All right. Do the draw. Okay, give me a second. So this person is going to get a um, Vera Wood dovetail saw and a marking gauge courtesy of Santa Claus who made the donation. Thank you. Good luck to all. All right, Jake, come on in here. Santa Claus even paid the hefty Super Dave tariff on trafficking that saw. Sending the sawdust? All right, here we go. And the winner is, the lucky winner, is Mike Evans from Tennessee. Congratulations. Mike Mark. Evans? Was he the first question? From Tennessee? No. Congratulations, Mike. And we have, we have to send off the last spot, too. I don't think it's shipped yet, but I got his address in there. It came. Okay, that's fantastic. Glad you were here with us tonight. We'll be back in two weeks, another Q&A. 
Maybe we'll even think of a new project to start. And we're going to film when we deliver, if the COVID thing allows us, we're going to deliver the bed desk Angie. So we'll make sure we film that so you get to participate that way as well. Thank you to Frick for an almost flawless, technically flawless, we went out once, production. Oh, the video we, went out, but that's that's hardware issue. That is oh, nothing. yeah, oh, yeah. That's, Jake, behind the camera, do a spin around. They'd like to see your smiling face. Go a little slower. Rex, holding the guitar. He got Thankfully the food. Not playing and it. getting the food for us. Most important. Megan, I didn't hear any. I didn't hear any shout outs to vets tonight. Well, Megan I wasn't. Didn't know if, I don't really. I didn't know yeah. if Rex had already been doing that. No. And big thanks to our entertainment, Manoli Kumbayas, who's. Music will become available all, uh, September 14th, you said? Uh, yes, it will be. Sept uh, September 14th, it'll be available. September 11th, uh, maybe 12th. It'll be uh, under Manoli Kios, and uh, I'll send you the link. Yes, we'll, we'll, put the, we'll put the link on the site. Several people have asked. Thank so you. we're going to close out tonight with another final tune from Manoli. We'll see you guys in two weeks. Thank you to all of our vets. How you doing? I just wanted to show you one thing there. We started a song, and uh, this uh, this guitar was donated by the Tenneth C. Luthiers Guild, and it sounds fantastic. Hold it for a second, Rex. And uh, this here one here I bought. Uh, it's a J45 Gibson. It's aging nice, and it's beautiful. I need, I need one second to see if you can get that out for no second. Uh, Jack this. I apologize, I didn't get it in time, but I want to give a big shout out to UPS. Not only did the, uh, they, UPS is actually taking care of shipping Zach's bench to Maui, and Jeff Church is who is the UP is from Goshen, Kentucky, and he's the UPS pilot, and he worked he took it to management who were all over it, which was awesome. I will make sure that I use UPS whenever I have to send something. And Jeff is going to go with them to present the bench. Still working on the actual date, but Jeff and UPS, thank you. Huge. Appreciate it. Thanks, Manoli. Thanks, Rob. Thanks, Rex, for reminding me that the microphone wasn't on. And uh, I just wanted to say that's a beautiful guitar, and every week, every two weeks, it sounds better as any thing that's made with wood. As it gets older, it sounds better. Here's a song I'm going to release next week, so thank you very much. And I remember when you left me, Tom, when I died in your lies, you laughed with bitter scorn. Kept me a prisoner with pleasure and fear. When I died in your lies, you laughed till don't care. I swallowed my pride to hide my pain. Sometimes I prefer to sleep alone and get my head all torn until I'm gone. Things have changed, yeah, they have changed. Why should they stay the same and just go on? I 
I'm no fun Then why'd you call me I never have money And honey we always fight Bit my tongue and said I'm sorry. To think we could talk it over for the night. I swallow my pride to hide my pain. But sometimes I prefer to drink alone. My head all torn until I'm gone. Things have changed now, they have changed. Why should they stay the same and just go on? Bitter. I'm doing fine When you feel better Call me next time But your love has been hanging me out to dry And I'm feeling you have changed yes they have changed like the wind and rain that make us strong